All right, thank you very much. I want to apologize in advance because yesterday I got a cold, and if you've ever presented, if you've never presented a Kai paper with a cold, it is the worst. So, my name is Nick Merrill. I'm presenting on uh, some work I did with my co-author and my amazing PhD advisor, John Chuang. Uh, the title of this work is From Scanning Brains to Reading Minds, Talking to Engineers About Brain-Computer Interface. So first of all, what is brain-computer interface? The basic idea is that you take uh, information directly from the brain, signals from the brain to, to control a computer without muscular activity, no muscular activity involved. And uh, you may have heard about this from Facebook last year at their huge developer conference. They announced that they were building a brain-computer interface to type. And uh, not to be outdone, Elon Musk is also uh, making his own brain-computer interface company called Neuralink, which prompted Wired and Wired's own Stephen Levy to announce that brain-machine interface is not sci-fi anymore. And indeed, it is not. There are all of these companies that will ship to your door for under 300 US dollars a brain computer interface with uh, developer friendly APIs and SDKs, uh, which opens the door to normals. And by normal, I mean no prior neuroscience experience, normal software engineers uh, to build BCIs for themselves. So, with the mix of Silicon Valley excitement and accessible developer friendly devices, we decided to ask, how do Silicon Valley software engineers conceive of brain-computer interfaces and their capabilities? And a uh, tightly entangled question, how do they conceive of the mind and brain in relation to those capabilities? Um, so in order to answer this question, we took a working brain-computer interface that we built to software engineers in Silicon Valley. We actually went to their place of work, their startups typically, and we sat them down with uh, this BCI that you see on their head. And I will uh, explain what this BCI is and what it did in, in a second, but first I'm going to tell you a little bit about what kind of engineers we were interested in in particular. Uh, so our, we had two criteria. Our first criteria was that we wanted our engineers to have no prior experience with BCIs. Uh, we're anticipating the expansion of BCI as a technical practice, so we're looking to that next frontier of practitioners rather than the practitioners rather than the ones that are already around. And also, we kind of imagine that people who haven't worked with BCIs will be a little bit more comfortable extrapolating about the future. Then our second criteria was that uh, we wanted engineers with a stated interest in tinkering with BCIs. There's kind of this long history in Silicon Valley of hacking and tinkering leading to commercial practice, commercial development, and so we're, it's kind of an homage to, this, uh, to that heritage, but also it, it kind of indicated that these engineers had some familiarity with BCIs, they knew what they were. Um, so before I, I get into the nitty gritties of, our, of what we did, I'm going to tell you what, how I see the current technical state of the art in BCI. So I've worked as a, as a practitioner, a technical practitioner in this field for many years, and here's how I'd explain it. Uh, you have this brain, you want to sense it, you can't drill into the brain, so the best you can do is kind of put some sensors around outside the cranium and pick up electrical activity at the cranium. Now, uh, this is called EEG. It's by far the most popular way to do brain-computer interface. Uh, what this really means, the analogy you'll often hear, is that let's say you have a baseball stadium or something like that, right? You have these four electrodes back here. Now let's say you put four microphones around the baseball stadium. You can kind of maybe get a sense for whether people are cheering and what section they're cheering in, but you probably can't pick up on individual conversations. So I think this gives you an idea for how coarse really BCIs probably are in practice. However, there is this one application that I personally have worked on uh, called pass thoughts. Uh, the idea, it's kind of like a password. You think a secret thought, and the way that you think it and the secret thought serves to uh, uh, uniquely identify you, to, to log you into devices. It's something that I've done a lot of past work on, and uh, another benefit of it is that it's one of the few BCIs that actually works. It, it takes very little time to set up. Many BCIs take months. This one just takes a couple minutes. Uh, to calibrate, and it will allow engineers, we felt, to work with a BCI really, for real, uh, rather than an imaginary one. And it's backed by all this peer review research. We kind of figured that that would help with uh, some of the legitimacy and credibility, especially with this highly technical, technical community we, we planned on working with. So we got eight software engineers, three of them were women, between the ages of 23 and 36, working in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we sat down with them over one, hours, over one hour, and we trained and tested this classifier in their place of work. So uh, train and test the classifier, what does that mean? Basically, we, we take the EEG signals, we're talking to them, we're doing this interview with them. While we're talking to them, we're collecting uh, signals from their brain. 
And these will be the positive examples. These are the examples from our target person. Now we have this pre-recorded corpus of signals from everyone else. We train the classifier on that, and the classifier is able to classify either to accept you are who you say you are, or reject you are not who you say you are. So the interface that the engineers actually saw looked a little like this. Every half second there would be a number on the screen, and the numbers would scroll across the screen. Um, so it's probabilistic, it doesn't always get it right, but you kind of get an idea for how accurate it is. You know, here this engineer is being accepted, here's what it might look like if the engineer is being consistently rejected, and it might also give some ambiguous feedback like this, where we're not quite sure what the outcome is. Now our big design goal here was that we wanted it to look like uh, the debugging experience. These are software engineers, we wanted them to be critical about our device, so to activate that criticality we kind of wanted to activate what Goodwin would call their professional vision and uh, kind of make it visually similar to their professional practice of programming and debugging. So we had it in this terminal view. So immediately, what did we find? Well, uh, it worked reliably for about half of the engineers. For the other half, it was kind of mixed all the time. However, for all of those engineers, uh, all of them made sure the feedback was real. They were highly skeptical. They would like take it off their heads to make sure that it rejects them. They would make me wear it to make sure that it rejects me. Um, but, and on all, in all cases as well, they quickly fell into these philosophical conversations about the brain and about BCI, which is what we wanted. So we found basically that software engineers had diverse beliefs about what the mind and brain are, and uh, kind of bucket them into three categories. The first kind of category we found is that some engineers believe that the brain is the mind. The brain is basically this computer, it's in the skull, it accounts for all our experience in the world. Okay, that's one category. A second category is that the mind is potentially more expansive than the brain. Perhaps the mind extends into the body, extends into the environment. And then the third is that the mind and brain are ultimately social constructs. Maybe they're correlated with some physical phenomena, everyone kind of granted that. However, the actual uh, boundaries between mind and not mind are contestable and contested. Um, and as one, was one subject put it, there's no logical bottom to what the mind actually is. However, despite these heterogeneous beliefs, we found this one really interesting shared belief, which is that the mind can and will be read by machines. So here's one subject uh, who kind of believed that the mind was uh, extended into the body. He said, the mind, oh, oh, hello. We're driven by single-celled organisms in ways we don't really yet understand, but there's got to be some sort of physical storage of memories or experiences. We just haven't quite learned how to read it yet. So here we see Alex is saying, well, you know, the brain isn't necessarily the entire mind. I mean, there are these single-celled organisms that are also potentially constituent of cognition. But because they're physical, we still can access them. We just haven't yet, right? And we see this even more extreme uh, example in Terence, who believed that there was no logical bottom to the mind. He said, the mind may have no logical bottom, but practically, this has no implication. We can still devise an authentication tool that does the job. Maybe in some way there could be this ESP thing where you could somehow read my thoughts. If we want to do something, we will find a way. So the thing I think is really interesting about this quote, by the way, is this acknowledgement that uh, engineers, you know, if we want to do something, we will find a way. To me, he says that engineers, at least some engineers, understand that they have this active role in enforcing or reinforcing kind of phenomenal experience in the world, uh, which is something engineers may not often get credit for. But, uh, you know, more to point, uh, this is someone who doesn't necessarily believe that the mind is real per se, yet still thinks it will be read. So overall what we found here is that there are these very heterogeneous beliefs about what the mind is among engineers, yet this shared belief that that mind will be read, or at least that such claims will be made. There were some uncertainties around BCI and the mind. Uh, a lot, most engineers had a high, a lot of uncertainty about the exact nature of the mind, that what they believed was really true. However, all of these engineers were quite certain about the future of BCIs, which is that they were going to be widespread. Everyone was going to have them at some point. There were also kind of a varying degrees of anxiety among all of these engineers. So some engineers said, well, you know, this is going to leak my private thoughts. It's going to be horrible. And on the other end, you have people who are like, well, what if they find out my Bitcoin wallet and steal all my Bitcoins, right? So to me, this kind of gestures toward this future for privacy and security that isn't exactly, it's kind of uncharted, not so obvious. We're not sure exactly how engineers are going to conceive of the risks around brain-computer interfaces. They might be as heterogeneous as engineers themselves believes are. And I think that these uh, results kind of 
have us ask, who are these engineers as people? Who are the software engineers? I think it's a good reminder that these engineers may be highly critical. Uh, their concerns might not be the same as the concerns of their users, but they're certainly not uncritical. And at the same time, these engineers acknowledge that they may reinforce kind of social structures and ways of relating to one another. Uh, this was brought up by at least half of our participants, the ones that are listed here in various ways. And you can read the paper for details on this. You know, due to time, I have to be kind of blasé about it. Now, I think that there are three kind of directions for future work that would be really, really interesting to go from now. The first is to do the same sort of study with people who are actively building BCIs. Now, this is a real uh, advertising copy from a real... BCI company, to me this ad is terrifying, but everyone's different. Um, I think that the image kind of evokes questions around race and class and gender, uh, and entanglements there with BCIs, and I think that the slogan, how good feels, kind of uh, raises also questions about normative ways of feeling, ways that we're supposed to feel, kind of echoing Nora Howe's concerns as well, um, in her paper in the sky. Another interesting population to work with might be people who are working on machine learning. Uh, they use neural metaphors often, in understanding how their algorithms work and what their algorithms are supposed to do. And it would be interesting to see how these uh, metaphors that they have apply or fail to apply in their ability to understand brain-computer interfaces or in their self-assessed ability to understand these, these uh, devices. And finally, I think there are policy makers, people who might create regulations. I, I have here a chart from uh, Richmond Wan and Steve Jackson's paper on uh, radio frequency bands and how that's governed in the United States. Basically, back in the 30s, there was this territorial metaphor of frequency bands as area or space, which can be governed and restricted. And uh, it's an interesting kind of exploration of how metaphors can come to matter. And looking at policymakers, seeing what metaphors they use to understand brain-computer interfaces, which might be quite different from those of engineers or, uh, or others, uh, would be very interesting because these metaphors may end up governing us. These metaphors may come to regulate. So finally, I kind of want to raise this call to build critically with BCIs in this rapidly emerging space with a lot of interest from Silicon Valley. I think that there's room for engineers and also for uh, kind of philosophers and design theorists like myself to go in to these kind of spaces of technical practice and see what's going on. Uh, there are a lot of stakeholders here, not just engineers. And I think all of these stakeholders have a kind of interest in asking preemptively uh, what roles BCIs might play uh, in, the, in the coming 10, 20, 100 years. And at the same time, I think building off of Phil Agri's work with AI and, and kind of Phoebe Sanger's theories of reflective design, uh, we kind of owe it to ourselves and to everyone to embed this critical and also reflective practice in this uh, rapidly emerging uh, field. Um, kind of as these devices become more widespread, the answers to the sorts of questions that we asked engineers in our study may come to matter greatly. Um, so I, after this presentation, am apparently still alive, which is great news. That's all I have, so I will uh, turn it over to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that really stimulating talk. Um, and so you've clearly thought a lot about this area and done a lot of like really interesting empirical work in it. And I was hoping that maybe you could comment a little bit more on that last point. So kind of being critical in terms of like building and like where that might lead us. So, I mean, uh, one of the questions that's sprung in mind is, do you mean kind of more like kind of critically reflective, kind of being mindful of what we're doing, kind of sense, or, or can we think about it also maybe in a little bit of kind of alluding to Mark's talk at the, the start of this session in terms of being a little bit more kind of critical, speculative, provocative, do you see a space for both, or could you tell us like what you're thinking about for next step? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I definitely don't think it's an either or. There's room for many types of design thinking uh, in this space, and I think especially there's work for uh, room for critical and speculative design, and I'll take this opportunity to plug my paper with Rich and Wong at the upcoming DISC, which is kind of a speculative design uh, uh, paper on, on um, BCIs. But I would also take an opportunity to say that, you know, as design researchers, our imaginations are limited too. Uh, and I think that there are really a lot of heterogeneous kind of interests that may intersect with BCIs in practice. And we need to hear from communities that are more marginalized, communities that are outside of our kind of rarefied design thinking circles, uh, to know what kind of concerns might be relevant. And what kind of cons and what we can do about them as well. Um, I hope that answers your question. Hi. Um, <clears throat> hi, I'm Yelena from Inria, France. 
Um, okay, it's interesting to um, raise awareness and be critical with BCIs, but you start your t like okay. Uh, I'm trying to. Uh, so, have you worked with BCIs, or you only had like a theoretical? I have worked with BCIs. Most of my work in my PhD has been and technical work on BCIs. Like, what kind of devices have you used? Like, you mentioned in the beginning of your talk uh, that you created this application that is used for passwords, something. And so, okay, let's just keep that particular example. So, tell me what, what kind of device do you use? And yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked because I have a backup slide about it. So, we use this, uh, this it's a device called the Interaxon Muse. It's about 250 US dollars. It communicates via Bluetooth. So, why this device? There are all of these kind of clinical grade EEG devices out there. Why do we use this one? Well, you know, I tried to make this case about BCI is now being available to engineers, to everyone, quote unquote, people with software development experience. So I was very careful to pick a device that fit that bill. So this is the device we use. It's a four-channel EEG, fits around the scalp. Okay, so what were you actually measuring? Yeah, we were measuring EEG activity at the scalp, and uh, we used the kind of uncompressed FFTs, uh, fast Fourier transforms the raw EEG data, and we use this to kind of make, as I said before, I can flip back, but yeah. we have you know, it's a binary classification tax. There are, uh -huh. you know, readings so that are from the target person and not. And those that we collected from the user in our kind of pre-interview stage, we used those as positive examples, and then we had this pre-collected corpus that were negative examples. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, no. yeah, I guess we can talk later. Sounds I good. Really need to okay, talk. thank you. Hi, it's Alyssa Ansel from Simon Fraser. Um, so it was really delighted, especially after our opening plenary, to see you talk for critical practice around BCI. So I work in this field um, with traumatized children. Um, there are many, many ethical issues. And I, I'm on a part of a working group right now with members of Facebook and Google, but also neuroethicists, physicians, and engineers. And we're just um, putting together a process to try and elicit what are the ethical issues and what might the guidelines be. So. I'm just kind of listening to you say we need to have critical practice, and yet what we have end of one example of is that engineers and computer sciences don't always think about ethics, and yet, um, and even if they did, we don't know yet even what the questions are to some extent, let alone what our guidelines could be. So I always get stuck in the, this sounds like an amazing idea, but how? So do you have any ideas on the how are we going to develop a critical practice around this, given that we don't even know what the ethical questions are yet. First of all, great question. Second of all, that work sounds fascinating, and I implore you to talk to me offline about it. Um, I would say kind of there's this fundamental tension between needing to kind of have this critical practice and also this kind of messy technical practice as it happens in the world being very, as Leo would say, improvisational, right? And uh, also this other tension that you're introducing, which is that we don't know what the questions are yet. And kind of if you're asking me with no empirical data to back it up, I would say that we kind of, are, I expect that we'll see some of these uh, in, you know, ethical concerns and questions emerge from observing technical practice and embedding you know, design thinking inside of these kinds of uh, engineering practices has the dual benefit, not just of maybe shaping the way that this practice operates, but also raising concerns that we wouldn't have observed from outside of this messy, in the garage kind of hacking. Yeah, ho hopefully. Hopefully. Um, and we are writing a forum for science, so we're happy to distribute that, but um, the, the how, we get stuck on the how, how to get people thinking about these things. So it's great to see you doing that as an exemplar, and I applaud your work. Thank you, thank you very much. So thanks very much. That concludes our session, uh, Provoking Design. Uh, I think many of the, the presenters will be around if you want to follow up with them. And one last thing, there will be the uh, arts thing at Kai tonight, so please check that out. It should be very cool. So thanks a lot. <laughs>